Bisous. Good morning. I'm Craig Finestead. I'm the pastor here at the Water's Edge. Uh, <clears throat> to all of you who are guests, thanks so much for joining us. We're grateful that you're with us uh, here this morning. Um, come back with us and worship with us again. We'd love to have you become part of our church family. I say this every week, but uh, <clears throat> you're unique, you're gifted, you have experiences, you have interests that can make us a better church, and we want to be a better church, so we'd love it if you could become part of our church family. To all of you, those of you who are online, thanks so much for watching us this morning. Put in the comment section about how God is uh, speaking to you, and that's one of the ways that you can worship this morning. So a couple things before I get started. Um, number one is there's an email scam going out that's affecting churches, and unfortunately, we are one of them. So what they will do is they will find the name of the pastor. Um, they'll send it to the staff, to any other email that they can get a hold of. It will say something like, hey, this is Craig. Um, you got a minute to talk. And it's never my real email address. If you get an email from me, it will either be from Craig at weomaha.com or Craig Finestead at me.com if I'm on my phone. Um, so they'll do like Pastor Craig at gmail.com or something like that. And they'll ask you if you have some time. And I'll say, or they'll say, um, you yeah, I'm in the hospital visiting a cancer patient. I told them I'd give them a $500 uh, iTunes gift card. You know, can you get that? And um, I'll give you the money. Um, so we did have one person that did do that. We were able to, uh, she actually texted me back and ask, you know, when I wanted the gift cards or how, and my birthday was yesterday, so it was really confusing. Um, <laughs> and I said, it was very generous, about a $500 iTunes gift card for my birthday. Uh, <clears throat> you have set the standards on birthdays here at the Water's Edge. Uh, but fortunately, what they do is they'll uh, ask for a picture of the back, and they'll use that code, and they use it to launder money, so it's like this big scheme. But there's a news story that's affected some Catholic churches as well. So if you get an email from me, asking for money, I'm in the hospital, That's just delete it. Um, now, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to ask you for money. Uh, <clears throat> that will still happen, but it will happen at the appropriate times. I would call my assistant if I needed the short-term thing, and if she wasn't available. <clears throat> I had this friend with way too much money and way too much time on his hands, so I would give him a call a second, and uh, we'll save the other stuff for the general offerings. Good news is uh, <clears throat> our um, first fruit offering for our From the Ground Up campaign is in. So y'all gave, uh, or pledged to give <clears throat> um, $2,029,000 over the next three years. Awesome stuff. Now in uh, January, we were trying to get about 15% of that. So this is a lot, almost 8%. Um, or we're trying to get 15% um, of uh, the total giving, which is one thirty-six of the campaign in front of us. So y'all, uh, not surprisingly, did well. The goal was 15% or $310,000, and y'all gave $353,629, which is 17.25%. So that's just awesome. Um, it's just so cool. And the really cool thing about this is uh, now we're going to be able to pay a lot less interest, and we can do more ministry. And that's why we're trying to get our debt eliminated here at the Water's Edge. So. Just y'all did a home run on that thing. Just thanks so much. Um, new sermon series uh, today um, is called Tough Love. So when you think about tough love, you're probably actually thinking about a parent uh, disciplining a, a child. And that's not what we're going to talk about for the next five weeks. Um, all the kids in here, oh, good. Thank you for that, Lord. Um, <laughs> so um, love in the Bible is not like our cultural view of love. Our cultural view of love is I have these intense, emotional, passionate feelings for another person, therefore I love her. Um, so when Jesus talks about love, when Paul talks about love, it's a verb. It's not something that you feel, it's something that you do. So if our life depended upon um, how we felt, like you would have to put a seatbelt on and like be prepared to ride a roller coaster for the rest of your days. Um, so thankfully, like how we love, it doesn't depend on how we feel. How we love, it depends on like this really predictable, graceful, um, heartfelt set of actions that communicate to another person that they're just as important um, to us as we are to ourselves. Um, yeah, so love is like this beautiful thing. I remember I was talking one time um, 
this guy was a friend of mine. I used to run with him when I was a runner, and uber successful guy. He was an engineer. He was an entrepreneur. He was, he was a very wealthy man, a little bit older than me, um, had three kids all in their 20s. The youngest of those three was 23 years old. Um, he didn't really talk about his family a ton. I just knew that the younger child seemed to be the one that he would you know, talk about the most, um, just because she was probably the most challenging of the three. So he asked me if the daughter, if him, and if his wife could all meet with me in my office, which I uh, agreed to do. So I met with them, and um, I, was kinda, I didn't really know why we were meeting. I said, what's going on? And so the mom started right away, and she says, well, um, you know, the daughter is uh, 23 years old. Um, she's still in college. She still has probably a year and a half to go. She works part-time, um, goes out too much, um, just doesn't follow through. She doesn't listen. So then the daughter, I asked her, like, you know, how do you feel about all this? And she said, well, um, you know, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm lonely. I'm depressed. Um, yeah, I don't feel I can live up to my mom and dad's expectations. You know, she always felt like she was being compared to her two older siblings. The oldest was a boy, probably five, six years older than her, so put him around 28 or so. He had um, uh, you know, already done his MBA by the time he was 23. He's you know, five years deep into his career doing cool things. The other sister, by the time she was 23, she was finishing up pharmacy school, and she was engaged to be married. Um, and, you know, the daughter just felt like she was compared to those two other siblings, and it was tough for him. And, you know, she started to cry, and the mom looked at her, and she says, don't cry, act your age. Um, so then the dad said, yeah, you know, we've just had some problems. Like, you know, I've given her some leads for some jobs, and, you know, she hasn't followed up on it. Uh, she does go out too much. And the daughter says, well, you, on one hand, like, you tell me to have a boyfriend, and on the other hand, you tell me I can't go out. I mean, how are both these things going to happen? Um, so then they just kind of, you know, went back and forth a little bit, and I looked at the parents. I said, okay, well, so we've been together like 15, 20 minutes at this point, and like, here's what I think is going on. Um, I think your daughter is at the bottom of this, uh, this big pit. It's a pit that's so deep that she can't get out by herself. It's a pit that's so deep that she can just see a little bit of light um, you know, from the top of the pit. And it's like the two of you are, are, are standing at the top of the pit. Um, and like you're looking down and you're yelling at her and you're saying, get out of the pit. Like, you know, she doesn't need your advice. Um, that's not what she needs from you right now. You know, this is like asking her to get out of the pit is like asking a person with a broken leg to climb a mountain. So then the dad, uh, the dad said, so what does she need? I said, well, what she needs is this. She needs you. I looked at him, and I said, she needs you. I looked at the wife. I said, she needs the two of you um, to go down in the pit and be with her. You heard the words she said. She's alone. She's afraid. She's depressed. And you can fix at least two of those three by joining her in the pit. So then, like, the whole thing changed. Like, the mom <clears throat> uh, was sitting here, the daughter was sitting here, and the mom, like, kind of, probably in as much loving way as she could, she just put her hand on the daughter's hand, and she kind of squeezed it, and... I was over here, and the dad was here, and the dad actually asked if he could change spots with me, and he sat right next to her. And the daughter, like, it was like this beautiful moment. The daughter, like, just put her head on the dad's shoulder, and they just kind of cried together. Um, and it was like at that moment they realized that this love stuff isn't easy. It's tough. You know, there's enough blame in this whole system to go around, Right? But she wasn't alone in the bottom of the pit anymore. She was with two people who did genuinely love her. They often you know, haven't loved her in the best possible ways that they could, but they do love her. So then as they were <clears throat> getting ready to leave and I'm getting ready to pray, um, the dad said, well, how do we get out of the pit? I said, well, you're the engineer. You figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, <clears throat> the thing is, is... Uh, 
she wasn't in the pit alone <clears throat> anymore. And now she had a chance with two other people in the pit to help her out of the pit. You know, that's how this works. Um, now, here's the deal. God did not create us to live like these lives of terrifying isolation. God didn't create us um, to live in dysfunction or conflict. God created us to live in healthy, life-giving, flourishing relationships with one another. So let's go to the Bible, Romans uh, chapter 12. We're going to look at verses uh, 12, uh, verse, chapter 12, verse 5. Now think about this. So it is then with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Now, isn't that really cool? Like we, we all belong to each other. Now outside in the uh, foyer area, you'll see like all these little paper dolls. You see them here up on the screen. And you'll notice that these are all different shapes. They're all different sizes. There's some different colors. And if you haven't done this yet before you leave, I think it'd be a really cool activity if you could uh, go out there and color some paper dolls. Like, make it your paper doll. Make it unique. And what we're going to do over the next four or five weeks is we're going to put them on the metal parts of the outside of this room. And what we're trying to do is show that uh, diversity is a good thing. Yeah, that we are all members of the same body. And it's our uniqueness. It's our diversity. Um, that makes us the best that we can be because we all belong to each other. Now, the reason that they had a chance to get out of the pit is because you had an engineer, um, you had a detailed person and the mom, and you had a very creative person and the daughter. Now, these three together can become more than all three of them could have become separately as individuals. Diversity is beautiful in that way. Now, I have discovered in my uh, 49 years and one day of existence... So for those of you who didn't know, it was my birthday yesterday. It was my birthday. Um, <laughs> Groundhog's Day. It happens every year. Um, they actually had a movie about it. Um, you know. So in my 49 years and one day on this planet, I have discovered, and I believe this with as much as I believe I'm standing in front of you today, I believe the quality of our life <clears throat> is almost 100% correlated to the quality of our relationships. I really believe that. Yeah, you can have all the money, you can have all the power, you can have all the good looks. Um, yeah, you can have all you can have all these things. Um, you can have your favorite team in the Super Bowl, and if you're watching it alone, it's worth nothing. You know, the quality of our lives um, are correlated to the quality of our relationships. Now, scientific data, like psychological studies, they totally confirm this. The highest predictor of a person's happiness isn't wealth, it's not, you know, power, it's not material possessions. The, pow the, the highest predictor of happiness is going to be our uh, high-functioning interpersonal relationships. Now, today is kind of general as we kick off this sermon on relationships. I want to lay a foundation, and at the end of the message, you're going to get the foundation for the rest of the week and the rest of the series. It's kind of the principle that all relationships are built on. Now, the next four weeks, they're very specific things, like um, how to deal with difficult people. I can see, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that one, man. And uh, <clears throat> this person said next to me, they've been difficult for the last 15 years, and Pastor Craig's going to clear all that up for us. I'm glad. And um, <laughs> so uh, we're going to look at how to... Um, we're going to look at how to uh, um, have tough conversations. You know, I think a lot of times, like, there's just some little adjustments that need to be made, and, like, these tough conversations will help us get there. We're going to look at how to be a less difficult person because uh, contrary to popular belief for many of us, uh, some of the dysfunction in almost every relationship does belong to us. Yes, yeah, so we're going to look at humility and, you know, how that looks. Then, uh, the last week, we're going to look at how to like live in conflict and tension, knowing that like every person you're in a relationship with is imperfect, so there's always going to be some conflict and tension. So we'll look at those things. But today, we're going to talk about how to get out of the pit. And even if we don't make it out of the pit, we're still in the pit with somebody else. And those feelings of being afraid and alone and depressed, um, we share those with someone else now. So the first thing we do is we, <clears throat> we seek the wow. And we embrace the, the whimsy. So that was the word I want us to look at here. Um, birthdays caused me to reflect. Maybe they do the same with you as well. 
I was just thinking in the last year, <clears throat> Craig did not have enough wow moments. I thought there was just too much predictability, um, probably too much work and not enough emphasis on um, my own personal relationship with God, with the people who matter most to me. I've had some really good wow moments over the years. And as I look back, I can say last year was probably one of my lower wow moment years. Um, now, here's why I was thinking about this. Um, the New Testament talks about, like, the early church and their life together. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 43, a deep sense of awe came over them. Now, like, if I were to use the word awe with your uh, spirituality with Christ, if I were to use the word awe in your interpersonal relationships, is this a word that you would you use to describe them? And I think for many of us it would be no. Now, you just, like, you just get that these people are together and they're praying and they're reading the scriptures and they're just hungry for more of God. Um, and the sense of awe has come over them. And in their interpersonal relationships, like they have this common mission that they're sharing together and they're doing amazing things. Like there's miracles that are happening and there's goodwill that's being achieved and there's all this really cool stuff and like awe is surrounding them. Now, the, this is the amazing thing. They weren't rich. They hadn't invented cable TV until like, you know, like 200 years later. Um, that's a joke. It was like 2,000 years later. Um, <laughs> They didn't have air conditioning, they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have a truck, but they had awe. Now, how many of you would trade in your cell phone for wow? How many of us would, uh, you know, give up our cable television for awe? Gosh, I would do it in a second. Um, you know, because, because, like, awe and wow is the stuff that life is best made out of. Yeah, so my wife is a psychologist. Um, that makes my life really interesting at times, by the way, but that's a whole other sermon series, um, like 12 weeks. Uh. <laughs> and, like, if you try to go see one of her uh, partners or her, like, you couldn't do it next week. There's no room. You, you probably couldn't do it the week after that because business is good. And the reason the business is good is because relationships are bad. And the reason that relationships are bad is because we have lost our awe and our wonder of what it looks like to relate fully to another human being. Now, we are people um, who are activity-rich and relationship-poor. I believe that. So I saw some of y'all went to, like, the Eric Church concert. Um, that's an activity. I saw some of you went to Aladdin that's an activity. Uh, so some of you went to the Harlem Globetrotters. That's an activity. You went with people, most likely. But I wonder how many people just sit in those rooms and they're thinking, um, I don't want this to end because when this ends, uh, I have to go back to my real life. I wonder how many people were sitting in those rooms and they were surrounded by people that they love. You know, they're watching, like, this brilliant singer, or this brilliant musical, or these brilliant athletes, and they still had, like, these feelings of loneliness. Um, you know, activity rich, relationship poor. You know, the awes in life are always almost going to include people. The wows are what make life full and flourishing. And, and here's what I want us to do. I want us to create... Um, experiences that leave us in awe. These will be the highlights of your life. They really will. Um, let me show you a picture. So this is, uh, in Norway, they'd say pre-stolken. Uh, translate in English to uh, preacher's rock. So this is uh, the most beautiful place I've ever been in my life. Um, it's about 80 miles or so from where my family lives. Um, Difficult little journey up there. You gotta climb this big hill and you go back and forth and um, a lot of people take the journey. Now, this is uh, a tough climb, but it's totally worth it. Now, you see that little ledge there? Um, it drops down 3,200 feet straight. There's water below that. So me and my son Benjamin, we actually like went like this. 
and we sat. And it was just like this air below us. And here's why we did this. Uh, look at the new picture behind me. This is what we saw. Now, this is awe, right? Like, this is, we're right in the middle of fjords here. This is awe. Now, I, would, I want to tell you something, though. Like, um, by myself, I would have said that this would have been a pretty cool experience. With other people, it was awe. Probably one of the top five experiences, the one, one of the top five wows of my life. Now, here's what I want us to think about. Let's not settle for awful. Let's not settle for average. Let's shoot for the experiences that are both wowing and whismical. Yeah, I think like with Benny going to college next year, like we've had like thousands of conversations over the last 18 years. I, I doubt very much I'm going to remember very few of the words, you know, that he and I ever spoke. I will guarantee you that I will remember almost every experience that we ever had. You know, it's kind of like this. I don't care what you say to me. Um, I care what you share with me. Yes, you know, so I'll remember like the runs through Platte River State Park. I remember the nighttime stories I used to tell him. I used to go into his bedroom, and I don't know if he's here this morning. Um, if you were here, Benjamin, sorry. Uh, so I would say once upon a time in a land far away, there lived a little boy whose name was Benjamin. And then like, we'd just make up the story, and like, we'd just go everywhere. And like, I'll never remember the specific words of the story. I'll remember the stories themselves. I remember um, teaching him uh, how to drive. Man, my prayer life just went through the roof. Uh, about a year and a half ago, if you noticed that I became better at praying, that's why. Um, we built train tracks when he was a kid. That taught me patience. We got detained in Russia together. Um, that taught me hope. Um, we made chili together dozens of times. That taught me how to go to Walgreens and buy acid reflux uh, medicine. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> so we don't need a plan then to do some of these things. Like some of the wow moments, the awe moments, like they just happen. We can't say, okay, we're going to do this and we're going to have an awe moment. We're going to have our wow moment. Like, you got to place yourself in environments where those happen. So you just got to show up, grab a parachute, and then when it's time, jump out of our shoes after the people, uh, the way that Jesus jumped out of heaven to be with us. So I believe that we have wow all wrong. So I'm going to show you a picture. Uh, who are the two people behind me? Anybody. The guy at the first service right away. Kim Kardashian, what's the guy's name? Chris Humphreys. So uh, does anyone know? They knew this was the first service. How long were they married for? You guys are good, 72 days. Um, so get this. Uh, her ring was 20.5 carats. Yeah, Amber's only like 15. I mean, where's he going with that? <laughs> <laughs> There's like... 10.5 million people that watch this on television. The way in itself, anyone want to guess how much it cost? $20 million. So on October 31st of uh, 2011, Kim filed a, a paper with the county clerk that she didn't want to be married anymore. Now I'm going to show you another picture. Anyone know who these two, two people are? So this is uh, Norma and Gordon Yeager. So on <clears throat> October 31st of 2011, this couple had been married for 72 years at the time. 72 years. On the same day that Kim Kardashian filed um, for divorce, this couple was in a terrible automobile accident. Now, it's something that probably a lot of us could have survived, but because of their age, um, they were not able to. They were in the ER of this little hospital in Iowa. Now, they were known as the couple um, who always walked down the streets holding each other's hand. So it appeared at the ER that they just weren't going to live. Um, so the nurses and the doctors, they uh, moved them into the same room. And 
and they put his hand on top of her hand. And within the course of 37 minutes, she died and then he died. Holding hands the same way that they, they lived. Now culture says, let's get the big ring, let's do the huge wedding, let's spend all the money, that's wow. Can you think of how many moments over 72 years that this couple must have had? Walking down the street from the bank to the cafe, probably later in life to the pharmacy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but gosh, there had to be hundreds and thousands of wow moments. We got wow all wrong. Um, we look for wow on the extraordinary, and I would say the wow is generally going to happen in the ordinary. All right, our second thing we're going to do this morning is uh, we're going to one another each other. So if you haven't heard this, this is the verb that I invented this week. Um, I'm really proud of this word, one another and each other. Um, <laughs> so I want you to think about like some possessions that you own. So just think of something that you just absolutely love. It could be like your golf clubs. It could be a bag. It could be a pair of shoes. Um, it could be a truck, a drone, like whatever it is. So how do you treat this possession that you absolutely love? Well, if it needs to stay dry, you keep it dry. Um, you put it in a safe place where no one can steal it. Like, you, you do the thing, you, you feed it if it needs to be fed, you change it if it needs to be changed. Like, you'll do whatever you need to do to keep this prized possession in top shape, right? So... Um, Think about a prized person in your life. So let me ask you this. Do you treat that person as well as you treat your prized possession? Do you let her know daily how thankful you are for her? Do you uh, tell him um, the things that you love about him? Do you serve her? Um, you know, do you uh, spend meaningful time with her? You know, I think if we would treat our interpersonal relationships as well as we would treat our prized possessions, um, things would change. It'd be different. They really would. So let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 44. Um, all the believers, they met together in one place, and they shared everything they had. So you read this, and don't go to, like, the whole socialism thing. That's not what this is. Socialism is a government telling you that you have to do something. There was no government that told any of these people that they needed to do a darn thing. These were people who were compelled to do this by the grace of God and the love of other people. So this isn't socialism. This is what's called charity. You know, it's, it's a form of one anothering. It's a form of sharing. Um, in Jesus, in, in John chapter 15, verse 12, and this is where the verb comes from, uh, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. So there's three parts to this short little text. Part number one is it's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. Um, it's not like some kind of moral imperative. This is Jesus saying, okay, I love you. I know what's best for you. I want what's best for you. So I want you to do this. I command you. You know, part one, that you love each other. That's part two. But then, like, gosh, it becomes brilliant and great at the end. Love each other as I have loved you. Love one another as I have loved you. He's the example. Um, so we're going to close this morning on just some different things that we can do to one another like Jesus. All right, the first thing we're going to do to one another like Jesus is we are going to uh, accept one another. So there's a woman at the well one time, and she was there at noon. Um, the only reason that you would be in a hot uh, well, like a, a well that's, you know, in a hot desert at noon, is because you don't want people to see you. If you needed water, you would have done that in the morning, or you would have done that at night um, as the sun was rising or the sun was setting. Um, she would have been ashamed to show herself in public. So it just so happened that Jesus was at the well. He asked her for a drink. Now, this is the longest encounter uh, in the whole New Testament that Jesus has with anybody. And basically, at the end of this conversation, um, 
He looked this foreigner, this woman who had failed many times. He looked her in the eye and he told her something that uh, nobody else was telling her. He says, I accept you. you know, so kids, I see a bunch of you all out here, middle schoolers, high schoolers. Um, you got a chance to do it this week. Like, you know, there, there's kids that walk down your hallway alone. There's kids that absolutely cringe when it's about lunchtime because they don't have anyone to sit by. And you can one another them by uh, inviting them to sit with you. You can one another them by learning their name and their interests and introducing them to some other people. There's a new neighbor, there's the unpopular coworker. I think there's some of us that need to one another our children it's like my friend, he didn't realize he was doing it, but he was comparing the youngest to the two oldest, and it was too much for her. You know, so yeah, there's somebody that all of us can want another. Uh, the second thing um, that we're going to look at, after you like, accept them, you, know, you, you start to care for them here. So I thought about, there's so many times in the Bible when Jesus talked about, uh, where he didn't talk about it, he did it, he cared for people. So I was thinking there was a guy with leprosy. Um, so it's really interesting, um, and we'll see this in the next little story as well. Jesus immediately didn't cure him of his leprosy. Do you know what he did before he did anything else? He touched him. Now, can you imagine what it would be like as a human being not to be able to touch anybody else, like for extended periods of time? And Jesus says, you know, I care enough about you, I'm just going to touch you. And then he healed him, the leprosy went away, but he cared for him by touching him. You know, think about, like, us. I mean, I, I really believe there's people in your life, you know, I, you might even be sitting next to the person, um, that you just need to climb down to the pit with them. You know, stop yelling advice from the top of the pit and get down to the pit with them. Struggle with them. Share with them. Encourage them. Give them hope. Um, that's going to be our third one, then, is uh, we get to uh, encourage one another. So Jesus did this with Peter. Um, Peter had a name, Simon. Uh, Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter, which means rock. And then he encourages Peter. He says, you know, Peter, um, uh, you're the rock that this church is going to be built on. You know, so for us, like, here's the deal. Um, for men, over 40% of us, our primary love language is words of affirmation. For women, the number is right around 25%. So basically, one out of every three of us in this room, the primary way that we receive love from other people is encouraging positive words. Now, think in your relationship. Are you using words that are going to build people up, or do you use words that tear people down? When you get home, right after work, is the first thing you do criticize or is it to uh, practice gratitude? Like, use good words. This is like such a simple, easy way, you know, to love another human being. Just got a couple more. Um, and this one is going to really be the foundation that we're going to build this on. Um, and it's this word right here. So we're going to talk about all these things over the next four weeks. Um, but I think until we can figure out how to walk down this journey of forgiveness, um, the technical parts of having a tough conversation, um, you know, how to deal with a difficult person, how to live in tension, um, I'm not really sure if they matter that much. You know, this is the foundation. You know, for any two human beings to be in a relationship with each other, there has to be practiced the forgiveness of sins. You know, so Jesus was uh, <clears throat> walking through a city, and they told him, um, I want you to go see this young man in a wheelchair, um, and I want you to heal him and make him well. So if you're going to heal someone in a wheelchair, what would you do? You'd tell him to get up and walk, right? Jesus didn't do that. Jesus says, okay, you want me to heal him? I'll heal him. He looked at the young man, and he says, son, your, your sins are forgiven. 
Because Jesus knew for this man in the wheelchair and for every last one of us, the healing that we need most is indeed the forgiveness of sins. You know, forgiving another person, it doesn't mean that necessarily the slate is wiped clean. It doesn't mean that you forget. Um, what it means is you're able to look at the other person. You're able to say, okay, I, I believe in you. I believe in me. I believe in us. And for the sake of our future, I'm willing to do everything I can absolutely do to put our past behind us. Now, there's no better example um, of the forgiveness of sins than Jesus himself. So what Jesus did is he took a cross, and it was a lot bigger, it was a lot heavier than this one. And it would have been on his back, um, would have went probably a few feet above his head, and it would have certainly rubbed against the ground, and he would have had to walk like this, it would have extended beyond his arms. And he would have carried this cross, there's people that were making fun of him, there's people that were beating him up, like literally to death. Um, his pain had to be like just grueling. And why did he do that? The reason he did that is so that your sin and my sin can be forgiven. He died this brutal, painful, disheartening death so that all of us can receive life. Now, what he asks us to do then is to love each other, love one another as I have loved you. So that's going to include the forgiveness of sins. So sometimes it means that we have to put our pride aside. Sometimes we have to say, okay, I'm right here, but I'm just going to move forward because I believe in this relationship, and I'm going to forgive. And so it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread, he lifted the bread up, he blessed it. He gave thanks, and he said, friends, this is my uh, body that is broken for you. When you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the wine, he blessed it, he gave thanks, and said, friends, this is my blood, it's the blood of the new covenant that has been poured out for you and the forgiveness of your sins. When you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. So I want you to think about these two things then. Jesus says, take the bread and remember. You know, so remember that Jesus one day said, this is my command. I love you more than anything else. I know what's best for you, so this is my command. Love each other, love another, as I've loved you. That's what you get to remember when you take the bread. And then when you dip into the juice, you get to remember something else, that he has died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins so that we can then share this forgiveness with those who have uh, hurt us, with those who have forgot us, with those who have offended us. So let us go to God and let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you as the church, and we come um, just in all sorts of relationships. Lord, some of our relationships are healthy, they're life-giving, they're flourishing. We wake up in the morning, we can't wait to text or call or, or see that person. Um, Lord, there's some relationships out here that are pretty darn close to 72 years, and Lord, these late relationships have created legacies, and I just thank you, God, for the example of uh, those who are leading the way as they relate to one another. God, I also come today knowing that um, in this room there has to be some dysfunctional relationships. Uh, there's just too many of us for that not to happen. And God, I pray for understanding. I pray for healing. I pray for hope. I pray that as we take these... Uh, five weeks in this journey together, that at the end of this time, we can say that, um, that we're getting better, that we're healing, um, that we're growing. Lord, we uh, confess our sins to you, both the things that we have done and the things that we've left undone. God, help us to uh, be people who do forgive as we are forgiven. God, help us not to hold other people up to the standard of perfection. Um, 
but let us with patience and grace uh, deal with the people that you have blessed us with. So, Lord, together now in one voice we come and we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, just a few things. If you are new to us, um, we want you to know that you're not only invited to um, have communion with us this morning, you're actually encouraged to do so. We would love it if you could come and uh, share in this uh, meal with us. The way this is done is you'll be given a piece of bread, you'll dip the bread into the juice, and then you'll eat the bread that is drenched in the juice. If you're on a gluten-free diet, you'll come through uh, my line. Bob and I will be honored to serve you. And for all of you, you'll just uh, move to your left. You'll come forward um, as the ushers or the greeters will uh, release you. You'll just go back into the row that you came from, so just walk around, go in a circle, and at that point, we will... uh, Uh, conclude our worship experience. So I invite you, I encourage you all now to come forward and receive the Lord's Supper.